Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek Lenten worship service for this evening. A reminder, this is the last Wednesday night service for this Lenten season. Of course, Sunday is Palm Sunday, which begins Holy Week. And so next week, we will have services on Thursday at 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and then again at 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock on Good Friday in the sanctuary. So this is our last Wednesday. Uh, our thanks to those who prepared the suppers each week. We're so faithful in providing that food, and my thanks to you for your loyal attendance each week as well. As you came in, I hope you picked up uh, the paper that is on the gold stand back there. The first page is the order of service, has the hymns we will sing in the order we are using. The second page is something that we I started on Sunday. Uh, as I explained then, this is something that our middle son, his church is doing, and Rick Warren out of Saddleback, the writer of Purpose Driven Life, he does it. A lot of the bigger churches are doing it now. They call it message notes or sermon notes. Um, it, offers, it gives you a ability to follow along the sermon uh, and see the main points as uh, the sermon is going along. Of course, in those churches, the one advantage they have is they have screens, so they have the questions up there and then the person fills in the answers so you know you put in the right answers. Um, but we don't have a screen to do that, so I try to make it clear when I come to what an answer is of mention it in such a way that you can answer the question as you see them. So uh, I will ask you to turn to those when we come to the sermon on the parable of the two sons. Let us now begin to worship with, O oh God, why are you silent? Hymn number 703 in the back of the red worship book. Hymn number 703. The text of this hymn was written by Marty, Marty Haugen, who was born in 1950. The music is Johann Sebastian Bach, Lutheran musician. Most of us have heard of Bach, and this is his music.
page 94 in the front of your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another.
mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A pastor received a call to go see a young man who was dying of a terrible disease. As a youngster, this young man had been brought up in the church, had received a good Christian education. But after he had gone off to college and then off on his own, he turned his back on the church and began to live a wild life, a life that based itself on seeking pleasure and seeking fun, a life that turned its back on the accepted morals and values of society. Uh, he lived a life much like that of the prodigal son and the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Luke. And so as he began to lose all his money, as it began to be wasted on drugs and alcohol and riotous living, he just developed a disgusting disease which brought him to the lowest part in his life. As he sunk to that lowest part in that misery, he was reminded of what he had learned in church as a boy and thought about his father's house. The pastor came and shared with him the words of a merciful God through faith in Jesus Christ, which are able to save for all eternity every repentant sinner. The man accepted the pardoning hand of God extended in the word and fell asleep in Jesus. His case was well known throughout the community in which he lived. Several days before the funeral was to take place, one of the prominent members of the church happened to run into the pastor downtown, and he asked the pastor this question. He said, Pastor, you're not going to bury that good-for-nothing scoundrel, are you? To which the pastor replied, Do you mean Brother John Smith, referring to the man who had died? Certainly, I'm going to bury him. Whereupon the good church member retorted, Well, if this man went to heaven, I don't want to go there. The pastor answered, Well, never fear, Mr. Goodman, you're not going. <laughs> what? said the good church member. This miserable wretch, John Smith, is to go to heaven and I'm not to go there? The pastor replied, not if that is a sentiment of your heart which you have just now expressed. Remember, brother, there is no difference in us. For we are all sinners and we are all saved only by the grace of Jesus Christ. The good church member, Mr. Good, represents those to whom Jesus is speaking when he tells the parable of the two sons. Jesus has entered the temple and he is confronted by the chief priests and the scribes, the Levites, and the, those who are supposed to be the specialists in the law and the holy scriptures. And they have asked Jesus where his authority comes from. So Jesus responded to them by saying, if you can answer my question, then I will answer yours. And he said, did John the Baptist's baptism come about by authority from God or from, his, uh, from himself? And so the chief priests and the scribes huddled together and they began to argue among themselves. If, if we say uh, that uh, John the Baptist received his authority from God, then he'll ask us why we didn't believe him and, and why we mistreated him and allowed him to be handed over to Herod and, and beheaded. But if we say his authority was what he made up, then the people will turn against us because they think he was a great person. So they looked at Jesus and they said, we don't know where his authority came from. And Jesus says, neither will I tell you where mine comes from. And then he says those opening words of our gospel lesson for this evening, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. Now again, Mr. Goodman, the good church member, represents the 
chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, all those in opposition to Jesus who think they are good enough to enter into heaven by the works they do. That they are leading an exemplary life, that they don't do the things that the sinners do, that they, they don't carry on like the tax collectors and the prostitutes, and so therefore they are up here, they are special, they're God's chosen, they're the ones God loves. You sinners are down here, you have no hope, you have no chance, so we don't want to associate with you. And pastor, for heaven's sake, don't let that guy's body come into our church and embarrass us, because we all know what kind of person he was. That is Mr. Good. He thinks he's better than everybody else. But Jesus is making a very important point with this parable of the two sons. And that point is understood by three terms that we read in the first two verses. The first is go and work. The second is today. And the third is changed his mind. If you understand those three words, three phrases, you understand the basics or the most important message of this parable. So let us look at each one of them individually and see what we can learn. And I believe that was the answer to one of your questions. Go and work today and change his mind. Go and work. This is an emphatic command. This is not a request. This is not the daddy coming to his son and saying, you know, son, it'd be nice. Uh, it'd really be helpful if you get up off the couch and quit playing with your PlayStation or Xbox and you go out into the vineyard and do some work today. We're falling behind on the harvest, and by you giving me some, a little bit of help, we will have a better harvest than what we're looking at right now. And so the son says, I'm not going to do it. He rebels, being disrespectful. But still, the command is here. Go and work. It means go now. You don't waste any time. It means that there's no option. In other words, son, you don't have an option. You go work. You go out to that vineyard and get busy. There is no alternative. You have to do it. The vineyard is the kingdom of God. The vineyard is the church. The vineyard is the church militant and the church triumphant. The vineyard is the church uh, of the kingdom of God, which we now have been given the responsibility of spreading on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What Jesus is telling us, if we want to be part of that kingdom, there is no other alternative but to have faith in Him. If we want forgiveness of sin and eternal life, there's no other alternative but Him. See, the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, whom he tells this parable to, they think there's an alternative. Their self-righteousness. The works they have done. But he is telling them that their works are no good. They are not only Mr. Goodman, they're the second son. See, they said yes to God at the beginning when God called them by taking the positions they had, the scribes, Pharisees, the chief priests, Levites, and so forth. But then they have not followed God's will. They have not tried to spread God's good news to others. Instead of teaching the truth that salvation, even in Judaism, was based on faith in the promises of God, like those he made to Abraham, they have taught a Judaism of works righteousness. They have made it so difficult with all the rules and regulations that it's almost impossible for anybody involved in any kind of trade or anyone who is poor to have any hope of accomplishing all those rules and regulations. And so when the father who represents God says go work, he's in the vineyard, he's saying become part of the kingdom of God because that is your only way of salvation. That is your only way of forgiveness. Now I know this isn't popular to say today. You've got people who want to say, oh, we're a pluralistic society now. Everything's the same. It's all spokes to the same hub. That's not what Jesus does. 
And that's not what Jesus tells us to teach. That's up to God. As to who goes to heaven and who doesn't. If God wants to let those of other religions in because they never heard of Jesus or had the opportunity uh, to hear about Jesus, then it's his kingdom. He can do whatever he wants. But as followers of Jesus, we are called upon to bring others into the vineyard. And that the only alternative is Jesus Christ. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through him. So we need to come to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus and then having Jesus as Lord and Savior, having Jesus as the master of our life, then we want to go and share that good news with others. We don't want to keep it to ourselves. We don't want to hide it. We want to bring others in. We want them to share that good news, that assurance of forgiveness and salvation. The religions of the world give you a prescription and tell you, we hope this works. Jesus tells us, I have died on the cross. I have shed my blood. It has paid the debt of sin that you owe. I have risen on that third day. I have conquered sin, death, and the devil. Have faith in me, and you are forgiven, and you have eternal life. You don't have to abide by a bunch of rules and regulations. You don't have to abide by a bunch of traditions and ceremonial laws created by people. You believe in my atoning death on the cross. You believe in my resurrection. You believe that I paid the debt of sin that you owe. You believe that I conquered sin, death, and the devil. You believe that I am the Son of God and salvation and forgiveness are yours. So go and work. No option. Go now. No alternative. If you want salvation, you go to the kingdom. Today, the word today, that means this day. It means don't wait until tomorrow. It means accomplish things now because tomorrow may be too late. And this has several implications for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Today, we need if we haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we need to do so because we do not know what the next minute will bring. If we have Jesus as Lord and Savior, which all of us here do since uh, we are members of the church and we baptize and we confirm and we commune and we, we uh, confess, now our responsibility, being part of the kingdom, is to bring others in. And it's to share that good news and to support that good news. It means that we do not turn anybody away, no matter the race, creed, color, gender, orientation, whatever, but that we accept all people who come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. The great evangelist, D.L. Moody, I've told you this story before, is giving a revival in Chicago. And on this particular night, instead of ending with an altar call, as he always would do, he ended by saying to the crowd, I give you one day to repent. Seems reasonable. Give you a night to think it over. Give you a night to make a clear decision. But unfortunately, the great Chicago fire and many of the people who had been in the auditorium that night were burned up in that fire. They died. And for years, Moody carried that guilt that by having said, I've given him one day to repent instead of repent today for there's no tomorrow. He didn't know how many people were lost because he hadn't given them that invitation to come to Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus says in the parable today, that's what it means we have to act today. There may not be a tomorrow. There might not be a next minute. There might not be a next hour. There might not be darkness. There may not be a morning. So when we have that opportunity to share the good news of the gospel, we need to share it now. Today, share the good news because a person may need tragedy later, and we do not want that on our conscience. But so often in life, 
we put off to tomorrow what we should do today. In January 2005, it was January 28th, I believe, Thursday night. Louisville had won a basketball game unexpectedly and by a margin far bigger than anyone had thought they would win by. I had gone out to Bechtel Avenue to pick up Matthew from his work. At that time, he was manager of GameStop on Bechtel, uh, next to Penn Station and uh, Sprint and so forth. And as I was listening to the post game and so forth, I kept thinking, I need to call Dad and see how happy he is with this win. I, I need to call him. Uh, but then at the same time, I thought, no, I'm not going to call him because I know how he likes to listen to the coaches' show afterwards. And, and the interviews and so forth, so I'll call him in the morning. And so I went to bed that night. Friday morning came, and a phone call came from my baby sister that Dad had had a massive stroke, and if I wanted to see him alive, Jim and I would better get to Louisville and quick. We made it in time. The last phone conversation I could have had with my dad did not happen because I had waited until tomorrow. That Friday, about 11.55, dad left the church militant for the church trial. So that's why Jesus says today, today we work in his vineyard. Today we share the good news of the gospel. Today we worship Him. Today we praise Him. Today we give thanks because we know not what tomorrow might bring. And then changed His mind. This is the key. The first son said no and then changed His mind. This word changed His mind, the phrase changed His mind. The Greek word is the same Greek word that is used. And translated as repentance and other portions of the New Testament. It means to regret what you did. It means to try to undo the damage you have done by something either you said or by some action you did. It means to change your life. It means to turn back to God. Again, the message is we must repent each and every day because we do not know what tomorrow might be. We need to repent daily of what we have done and turn back to God seeking that forgiveness which we know He gives us through repenting. The crowd to whom Jesus was speaking thought they were righteous and in no need of repentance. They did not need Christ and so they were the son who said yes but did not go. The son who said no but went, who repented, who changed his mind, they are the sinners like ourselves. Who know we need repentance. Who before knowing the love of Jesus Christ carried the guilt of sin upon our shoulders as a heavy burden, finding no relief anywhere. And it wasn't until we heard those forgiving words of Jesus that that great burden was light. So that is why Jesus came into this world as the writer to the letter of the Hebrews said in our first reading. He said, Jesus says, Behold, I've come to do your will, meaning the Father's will. By that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been sanctified, that is made holy, that is made a child of God, that is made part of the kingdom which cannot be separated from us by anything on earth. That Jesus came and died so that we might have that forgiveness. So that we might have that opportunity to repent. That we might have that opportunity to change our mind. To turn around. To undo. Try to undo what we have done. So we cannot put repentance off. But daily should repent to God. For the sins we have committed. Known and unknown. Throughout the day. Because we all sin. We cannot be judgmental. Like Mr. Good. The good church. Because we all sin, we cannot say this person is going to 
heaven in this person's life because we don't know what's in their heart. We cannot make any kind of judgment because before God, sin is sin. And you are kidding yourself if you think because the only sin in your life you ever did was a little white, white lie. Therefore, you didn't murder anybody, you didn't rob anybody, you didn't beat up anybody. So you're okay. Sin before God is sin. The littlest sin to the most horrible sin is the same in the eyes of God. <coughs> And that separates us from God. Unless we repent and seek forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And then by that repentance, of worship, clean by the blood, he shed on the cross. So we do not worry about judgment. That is God's business. But what we do is we accept God's grace as it is freely given to us now. We share it with the others and we repent daily. So that like Jesus, we daily can do our Father's will. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. Amen. Before we go to the hymn, does anybody have a question they need an answer for? On your sheet. Didn't make clear. Now it's time to ask. Okay. Let us now sing, My God, how wonderful thou art, hymn number 863 in the back of your worship. Hymn number 863. This is March the 16th. We're in the last uh, Wednesday in Lent. Uh, this hymn is written by Frederick W. Faber, who lived 1814 to 1863, but the music is from the Scottish Psalter, it's a Scottish hymn.
Uh, let us turn to page 105 to the words of the Apostles' Creed. And with the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Next week is Holy Week, and we have services on Monday, Thursday, on Good Friday, and then on Easter Sunday, and we also have an Easter breakfast. We invite you who are watching this on YouTube to come and join us, to be with us, to repent, to believe, confess, to be born again every day as we are, and to be with God forever as we respond to Him. As Pastor has stated in his parable uh, meditation tonight, the parable of the two sons, Jesus talked about the two sons who worked in the vineyard, one who said he would not, but then repented and worked in the vineyard, the other one who said he would and did not. We need to learn the lesson that we are able to repent, that God is always willing to accept our forgiveness of sins. As we mark these 40 days with repentance and forgiveness, let us pray for the renewal of the church and the restoration of the world to the life of God. Our response is, hear our prayer. For the whole people of God, that we may drink deeply of the refreshing waters that come to us through baptism into Jesus Christ, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For artisans and artists of the church, that God might bless the efforts of their craft and so guide others to experience Christ more completely. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For those in the world who do not know the life of God, that they may learn of the new things God is doing in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For those suffering from unemployment, persecution for the faith, or illness, that they may have their needs supplied in the Lord and through this Christian community. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For those who prepare to affirm their faith and to respond to the call of God in Christ Jesus, that they may grow in trust and understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Remembering those who have died in Christ, we ask that we may press on to know God in glory as they now do. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, hear us as we pray and sustain us with your hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We conclude our worship with the Lord Jesus, Think on Me, hymn number 599, the back of your worship. This is a very hymn old Linton hymn. It was written by uh, Synesius of Cyrene, who lived 375 to 430. And the, the music is also old, was written in the 1500s, ancient Linton hymn. service on YouTube. This is St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. We invite you to join us on uh, Sundays, 8 o'clock worship, 1030 worship, Sunday school, 915. Come and join us. Repent, believe, let Jesus come into your heart, make him ruler of your life. Be born again every day. Walk with God. Have the creator of the universe with you. All you have to do is ask. He's standing at the door and knocking, waiting for us. And we'll enter into our being, into our soul, be with us forever, from now and through eternity. We invite you to come worship on uh, Good Friday. We invite you to come worship Monday, Thursday, Holy Week next week, and Easter Sunday. This is our last uh, Wednesday night Linton service. We're happy that you've joined us to worship with us and we invite you to come worship with us anytime. <laughs>